who came out on top, what yeah. picks were strong there. That's always the one of the things I'm most intrigued by when we have these matchups of teams that you know are looking to make a name for themselves. Yeah, so we had Tony and uh, Chernwalker found away by Ferox. So interesting balance does leave things like the Anchor and the Reza open. Fortress, very solid first pick. It's one of the first picks that we were seeing a lot at the start of the tournament. It's even less common in more recent games, but still, I think just a very solid pickup. Just great captain. You can play him as a jungler either. Just very versatile, very high. Ooh, Anka right off the bat by the yeah. side of Ferox. So looking for that early aggression. And if they match it with a Grump Jaw, I think that's a perfect pairing to go for and just start rotating around the map early on. This is showing to me that Ferox is going to try and play early and play to those strengths that they have set up in the early game. Yeah, absolutely. We'll see what they're going to be able to do with this one. Lance going to be a second pickup as well. We've been talking about how Lance can be a very strong top laner. But you can play it as that captain as well. You can play as jungler if you really want. Quite a versatile pick right now. Just the amount of utility that he does offer as a pickup. Lorelei going to be locked in as well for the likes of Hammers. So they've kind of got sort of captain roles fulfilled. You could maybe go for another captain later down the draft. You could go with something like an Arden as well, just to sort of round things out. But we'll see where they choose to go. Yeah, it's definitely going to be an intriguing uh, set of circumstances coming through. You see with the with the Lance already there, again, you, you mentioned the fact that you can set up some team fights. You can have really strong engages with the Lance, which is something that a lot of teams have actually struggled with a bit. A lot of the teams that we see, you know, falling in the VPL event teams that don't have that hard engage. They don't have the ability to get in to a team fight without losing most of their health in the process. So something like the Lance can really help with that. Samuel, of course, has just been such a dominant pick uh, in this VPL, so prevalent in that the fact that he has that sustain, the long range, and the oblivion that can put members to sleep. We've had some incredible oblivions across the course of the tournament. It's such a game-changing ability. We'll see how Chamu is going to be able to use that across the course of the game. They've got two CP carries locked in. I'd expect Ferox just to finish off with a weapon power carry of their own. Gwen will be the lock-in here for Hammers. We have seen some incredible performances on Gwen recently. PvP Warrior on Vision especially yep. is like the highlight in my mind of Gwen playing. Yeah, Hundor made, so a, made a case for that Hundor as well too, yeah. earlier today. Uh, Gwen definitely is becoming one of the most prevalent and most you know dominant of these bottom laner Absolutely. weapon power carries. Catherine is going to round out the composition. Catherine is one of these picks that we see every so often. It really kind of seems to be like some teams just really love this Catherine pick. Other teams don't care for it at all. Obviously, Hammer is going to try and take this, uh, the stuns to try and maybe interrupt things from like the Arden. You can interrupt the uncle when she jumps in, stun her. All of a sudden, she's very, very vulnerable. Yeah, absolutely. We do have a Rona as the final pickup here for Team Ferox. How likely be going into that 1v2 lane. I actually personally love Rona. I think Rona's a fantastic <laughs> pick. I, I don't think that she deserves to be as low priority as she currently is, so I'm curious to see how well Ferox is going to be able to use that Rona. Yeah, it'll be very interesting to see. We have seen Rona, like, I think once in VPL thus far. Didn't have the greatest of showings, but it is still a pick that I think there is potential for it in the right situation, especially, again, with a Lance. Like, you, there's so many heroes that just pair really well with Lance. Yeah. Like, Rona, especially, if you start that ultimate with everyone getting stunned up by a Githian wall, you just do so much damage. Yeah, you really do. I, I mean, Rona, as a pick, I think you can take over a game if you can play it well, and I'm expecting Ferox to play well. Let me just remind you guys, this is to fight for their spot in the top four right now. This is the flagship match for today. Hammers up against Team Ferox. I think it's about time that we jump on into this one, though. Hammers against Ferox. They're fighting for top four. They're fighting for their right to stay in for that prize pool. We'll see who's going to be able to take this one. So I'm going to pass it over to our casters. It's going to be Flash X. It's actually going to be tasty bacon. Game number one, Hammers Force against Team Ferox. This is perhaps going to be one of the closest matchups we have had thus far. Both these teams very, very evenly matched. A lot of players with a lot of different experience. Pico getting one of his signature heroes on this Anka. Surely going to be one of the huge different difference makers here in game number one. My name is FlashX. Human is not going to be joining me for this one. That's all right. We can hold the fort down. 
by ourselves. A little bit of early game jungle trading as Papa John and Moji, Moji invade into Hammers. Top side jungle, Hammers going into Team Ferox's bottom side jungle. Some Crystal Treants being secured. Definitely a little bit of back and forth action. Mixi securing that Crystal Treant for himself. We gotta take a look at these compositions. I, I think that these are two very, very even compositions. We have some very interesting things on both sides of the coin. Ferox opting to pick up the Rona. Definitely not a carry that we have seen very much so far here in the VPL. Will be very interesting to see how it plays out. I don't like it personally. I think the Fortress and his Mortal Wounds is gonna be very, very effective at shutting it down on top of that level. We saw his uh, pre-game interview feeling very confident on that Catherine. Those stuns are going to be extremely hard for Rona to deal with. In classic North American fashion, things starting off a little bit slowly. Both these teams securing their jungles. Not too much overaggression. A little bit of invades. A lot of vision spread all across the map by both teams. I think Hammer's certainly getting the upper hand. We do have Illist stepping into the roster for Hammer's, taking Junami out of the picture. And don't worry, Flash, you are not actually alone. I've been waiting for you to take a breath so I can come in with the dynamic duo back together again. Obviously, you said Ferox, you know, a strong composition, but that Rona is definitely going to be kind of a catalyst for this one. You, know, If the Rona can succeed, I think they're going to have a lot of success on this one, but it's all about setting up this Anka. Here comes our first fight of the game, though, as it is going to be everyone kind of posturing up for this Crystal Treant. Not really willing to hard commit. The Drifting Dark's going to get a lot of damage down, but all of it's getting eaten by the Treant. There's an Impale going in. Githian Wall's not going to land any stuns. The Crystal Treant does go over to the Rona, but now they have to escape. They go one for one thus far. Anka the first casualty, but Catherine falls as well. Moji and Rock Bomb are low. Shamu also going to get dropped very low. He's going to be the next target and will fall. So when all is said and done, it's going to be a two for one in favor of the side of Hammers. Tasty! Hello, old friend. Thank you for bailing me out of this. Hammers, what bit more Moji going to be able to escape right there? I hope you're doing well. I was very much mentally prepared to talk that entire <laughs> game without breathing. I, I was actually here the whole time. I was literally waiting for like you to take a breath just so I could get a word in, but you were just, you were on fire, man. So great job holding down the fort uh, for those first four minutes or so. But yeah, this is again, I mean, hammers with that small advantage. They did lose out on the tree and, but they end up getting themselves uh, back into a favorable position. Yeah, Hammer's definitely the stronger showing here in the early game. Gwen picking up another kill onto Anka in that bottom lane. I don't know if we talked about Hammer's preseason and, and how much of an improvement they have uh, <laughs> made since then. I think, I think they struggled. Has been mentioned once or twice. Once or twice. Okay, all right. I, I just want to make sure that that point was clear. Hammer's struggled in preseason. They're looking much better in the quarterfinals, certainly looking to advance to the semifinals right here. Doing a great job pressuring all the map. Illist and Archaic getting engaged upon in the bot lane. Yeah, it's definitely going to be uh, Gwen getting that turret, but Fortress does go down. Illist, meanwhile, though, turning the damage right back onto Pico as Gwen has been looking so strong over the last few weeks, Flash. Yeah, Illist has certainly stepped up his game quite a bit, slubbing into that starting bot lane position, looking very good. We see some major item power spikes coming in. That first turret, we I don't know that we've seen a tier one turret fall so quickly in any of the games today, but that's going to be super important. Mixi already has his Aftershock online on that melee. That's going to enable him to just hugely hugely exacerbate the burst damage coming out of his combos that's going to be something that team ferrex has to be very careful of yeah absolutely you see pico in a bit of trouble again this can be archaic chasing him down through the jungle but getting that first turret early is so important because it frees up illus to be able to rotate around with the team up in the top lane meanwhile though that is going to be the duo of the rona getting him able to find a kill alongside her teammate and now they can look to try and push in their top turret 
to even up this turret game as Ghostwing spawns. Be interesting to see if either of these teams make a move. It looks like Hammers really want to get this early Ghostwing online. That's great objective control by Hammers. Unfortunately, they're going to be losing two turrets very quickly here in the top lane. Ferox, unfortunately, they are going to lose out the Ghost Swing, but taking down those two turrets opens up the map so much for them. If they capitalize on that, if they group together, if they take a lot of these team fights and have a numbers advantage, that could pay dividends as this game progresses we are very even in gold at team Ferox with the slight lead i think primarily coming off the back of all those turrets mick sheen ali peterson taking a little bit of damage in the mid lane careful yeah definitely got to make sure you don't get caught out by the lance impales so much damage can potentially follow up if you get stuck in the middle of the lane like that so uh, and it's something that they're gonna have to be very much aware of as this game goes on especially you know joe and i were talking about it on the desk Team Ferox, one of their biggest strengths is their full-on late-game team fighting. They are seeing a few more Tier 3 items starting to get picked up. The Aftershock for Archaic on this Fortress is going to be huge. That's going to be a nice fight over this Crystal Champico going in deep, a very aggressive manages to get out, at least for now. The Ultimate doing a lot of damage. Allie Peterson keeping the team full health, keeping the fight moving as it's going to be Hammers chasing on down. They're looking for kills. They're going to find a couple, but it's still Anka and the Fortress that fall. Now the rest of the kills start to drop. Rona and Catherine going down, and this is going to be, once again, Hammers coming out on top as Gwen finds another kill. And this Gwen, you have to be careful that this doesn't get away from you with Gwen starting to find more and more kills. Camming out on top indeed. Hammers looking really good in that team fight. The attack of the pack dropped by our kick at the start of that completely negated all of the splash damage that Moshi on that Samuel was able to put out. That's going to be very, very important to make sure they are fighting around that ability, taking engagements when it's up he's got already got a lot of cooldown in his kit archaic he's got the aftershock that's really gonna help make sure those wolves are coming up just a little bit faster hammers narrowing this goal lead it is dead even at this point both of these teams making sure that they are grouped together when these team fights do break out rock bomber needs to find a block on this rona in order to make sure that his red mist is not being shut down yeah, and that's actually one of the other things I wanted to kind of talk about here is the amount of mobility on the side of Hammers when they go in for those engagements. You mentioned the attack of the pack, obviously going to be really helpful for going into a fight, but you have Archaic able to provide additional movement speed to the entire team. There's actually Moshi taking a bit of damage here in the mid lane, and it's going to be Anka actually binding Illus down in the bottom. He's going to pay for it, but getting that shutdown can be huge for the side of Ferox, but you've got Gwen with her skedaddle, you have Merciless Pursuit from Catherine, you have then the pools getting put down by Lorelei. There's so much mobility for this team. When team fights start to break down and you start to get kited away or you know, dove onto, you can maneuver so well. And we might be about to see a little bit of that as this is gonna be once again, this Crystal Treant, which has been so hotly contested. The first kill onto the Rona. That's gonna be Arden's gauntlet getting used, but not really too much effect as he has to leave the gauntlet shortly after. Nice Impale is gonna lock up, lock him up, but that's gonna be Samuel actually falling as well. So again, Hammers coming out on top in these early trades. They've got to be feeling good. They're coming out on top, but they're still a little bit down in gold. Ghost Wing back online now. I would love to see Hammers finish off this mid lane turret, then promptly go down, secure that Ghost Wing. Pico, though, looking to engage. Yeah, Pico's trying to get this kill onto Illus once more. A lot of shielding thanks to the water wall, and they're not going to be able to find the kill. They do save that mid turret, but they lose their top turret in the process. So Hammers splitting up the team, saying, you know what, we're going to guarantee ourselves at least one of these objectives and getting that top turret has really evened up this gold uh, once again you see about a four or five hundred gold lead or so which really doesn't amount to much at all in the grand scheme of things no it's still very much anyone's game at this point pico such good mechanics on this anka that's hands down one of his signature signature heroes it is very very annoying to play against I've had the misfortune of doing so, but Moshi being caught out of position. Yeah, Moshi is just going to get absolutely annihilated there. Three on one, not too much you're going to be able to do in that situation. But now Ferox, they have to make sure that they don't lose too much off of this. 
They are going to lose out on their weapon tree, and that gets stolen away. And now hammers, do they look to rotate towards the ghost wing? I think that would be a smart call from them, knowing that you have the man advantage for at least a few more seconds. Go ahead, take advantage of that. Force Ferox to have to try and come to you if they want to defend against this. Ferox knows what's happening. Pico on this Anka can do an absurd amount of burst damage. He's just going to let it go, though, as Ferox starts to pressure this mid lane turret. They're not going to be able to get it. Instead, they are going to steal away that crystal power treant. They need to group together, though, if they want to find a good engagement on the side of Hammers. But Anka is still hanging out in the bot lane. Archaic was pretty far forward on his own, but the rest of the team was there to follow up. Meanwhile, Ferox just backing away, letting Pico do his thing down in the bottom lane. Keep in mind, in the preseason, it was Pico that made the highlight reel for going and making a solo backdoor into an enemy base, then teleport bootsing out uh, to rejoin his team for a fight. So he is no stranger to going off on these solo missions, looking to take down objectives, but it may just be a little bit too early for that. Like, obviously, again, you need to stick together with your team, like you were saying, so that you can prevent these clean objectives takes that Hammers have been looking for. They've gotten themselves two Ghost Wings. They're looking for Black Claw now. It's getting pretty low, but here is Ferox to defend. A Gauntlet's gonna go down. That's gonna be a huge Githian Wall Thun into the Gauntlet Wall. And now the fight has broken it down, and Rona is just gonna drop. Nothing to help keep this Rona alive in the middle of the fights. And Hammers are turning this one right back onto Ferox. They're chasing down two, three kills, looking for Pico now. He's gonna get to the safety of his turret. But that was a three for zero in favor of Hammers. And now they just turned their attention right back to the Black Claw. The Ghost Wing Barrier buff, so critical for Hammers to get the upper hand in that team fight. They use it to their advantage. They quickly turned on a Ferox. Pico might be looking for a steal. He could, but he's not going to find it. Instead, it will be his life that is stolen away. Papa John goes down shortly after. And now with Black Claw pushing it down the mid lane, this is Ferox on the back foot as Hammers. They're gonna send most of their team actually up top and say, you know what, Black Claw can push mid. We're gonna shove top, try and maximize as much as we can on this. Because they got two kills, they are able to make this split push work very effectively. I think that that's a great call coming out of Hammers, definitely maximizing their opportunity right here. They understand that all of Ferox is in that mid lane. They're just gonna continue pressuring Pico, trying to do what he can to poke. I don't know if it's going to be enough. Oh, big damage actually coming out from Papa John there, but Archaic is the target that gets low. That's not really the target that's going to be helping you win the fight to take him down. They do get that kill, but immediately Hammers are able to turn it back around. Rona finally getting some good damage in with the red mist, and all of a sudden, Ferox has just cleaned house a stun onto the Catherine, and that will be an ace for Team Ferox. Where did this come from? It's not just an ace. It is a massive gold swing back into their favor. 2K after being down. They have got to feel super, super good about that one. We gotta talk about Papa John's build though. He has a spell fire and aftershock. Certainly <laughs> not a build that you see every day on Arden. Tasty, you're the Arden expert. What do you make of this? I mean, I love the weapon power. I actually, the spell sword is an item that is uh, still kind of up in the air on i'm still undecided because you don't get all of the benefits from it but having that aftershock for that burst you saw how much damage he was able to do when he jumped in with that blood for blood the crystal power arden full crystal i don't really like the web power arden i obviously love but mixing the two is creating a really unique situation for papa john to be able to provide a lot of damage but he also has that crucible to still provide the utility and the vanguard for his team. Uh, that's gonna be so important because you saw Rock Bomber, when he is able to stay healthy in a fight, he just starts melting through opponents. And that's gonna be important, having that Crucible to give him a little bit of extra durability. Two Crucibles, in fact, Papa John and Shamu both wielding one at the moment. As now they're looking for another fight, it's gonna be Pico getting some good damage down beforehand ultimate obviously going to be on cooldown now for about 40 seconds but the ferox all of a sudden they're the ones starting to position aggressively feeling a bit confident after that last fight going straight into this turret nate taking a very very low ferox definitely the ones controlling the tempo at this point 
We also gotta talk about the fact that Papa John opted to max both his Vanguard and Blood for Blood first, and he only has one point in Gauntlet, so they are not even relying or playing around this Gauntlet whatsoever. He wants to be able to do damage. He wants to go in, find some of these squishier backline carries like Illust on this Gwen or Mixi on this Meline, and try and blow them up. But if uh, Lorelai is able to find a great water wall, all that damage can be completely negated and is definitely a very risky play. Yeah, well, that's also one of the things that Ferox has to think about is that water wall. It's going to be used to save a carry. So maybe you choose one, start to get the damage out, wait for the water wall, and then immediately switch targets. It can be very difficult to have that level of target selection in the midst of a fight. But if you can, they can maybe take advantage of that cooldown. A nice Githian wall is going to stop Hammers in the track. But Pico is not involved yet. He's going to come in late. And that could be massive for them because he's untouched. Just cleaning house on the back lines. And Ferox are finding the fights. They are turning this game on its head, Flash, as they find four more kills. Level the lone member to escape this fight. Rock Bomber is looking for him, but he's not going to find him. But it's a four for zero in favor of Ferox. That is a huge exchange. Right before that fight broke out, Pico was heading for that bottom lane. There's obviously a huge wave there. Thank God he turned around and went back to his team. <laughs> he is so well known for his split pushing ability, but boy, did his team need him in that team fight. The burst damage and the mobility of Anka is so hard to deal with level on this catherine really needs to be saving the merciless pursuit to make sure that you pico on this anka is the one that he is shutting down because that that damage is so hard for hammers to deal with and right now they just don't have an answer for it and and like i said the allure of that farm in the bottom lane almost helped pico in that situation because he joined in late he was all the abilities were already used this time he gets blown up right off the bat and he is the first to fall that is not the way ferox wants a team fight to start see slumbering husk popped onto the rona but they're chasing down moshi not going to be able to find the kill though as it's actually going to be rock bomber taking down the Malin, and now they're going to be looking to continue this hunt into the midst of the team Rona is just holding on so well now that it's gotten later in the game. A great Githian wall is going to find a stun. They're trying to take down Level or Ali Peterson. They don't really care which one they get. They're just going to take them both. And Black Claw is still pushing Team Ferox. 19 to 18 now on the kills. They've gotten the kill lead. They're on to the armory. How far are they going to look to push this? Looks like they want to take this top lane as well and just break this base wide open. I think that that's a great decision. Very calculated, not overstepping. They understand these death timers. Mixi on the Malin coming back online. Gwen very shortly behind them. They have an armory. They have breached the base. There's only one turret left standing for the side of hammers. Barox in complete control. You, you thought at the start of that fight with Pico going down so quickly that it was going to be all over for Ferox. But Ferox, they turned it around. The Arden combo with Rona, so much barrier, so much fortified health. With that Serpent's Mask, she healed, she sustained, she built up those breaking point stacks, and as soon as, soon as she had 25 stacks, it was all over for Hammers and uh, Ferox putting their first armory on the board. And this is such a like tough decision for Hammers, because who do you focus in a fight? You obviously want to take down Pico early, but if you don't take out Rock Bomber early as well, like you mentioned, those breaking point stacks are going to build up and he's going to be able to survive for so long and do so much damage in the midst of these fights. But this is exactly the way Ferox plays. Like we mentioned it on the death, their early game, not the strongest, but their late game team fighting. They've caught Hammers out completely, diving into their base while Hammers were still in the middle of the map. Hammers have finally recalled, but they're going to lose at least an army off of this. How much more? Here comes the Red Mist spinning around on top of Hammers. The armory has fallen, but Pico and Mushi, they're still looking to try and survive and get some damage back. Big Gethian Wall is going to find a stun, and there is so much damage being done to the side of Hammers. Rock Bomber is still nearly full health as they find another kill, and it's now Moline trying to be a wall of defense, but not really going to be able to survive too much longer. Has to run out of the base to try and recall, but Ferox. They are on to the Bane Crystal. There is not enough damage left from Hammers to stop this. And Team Ferox will come from behind and take game number one. 
That was some beautiful vainglory. We knew Ferox was going to be good. I don't know that I re realized they were going to be this good. That was absolutely phenomenal stuff. Let's go ahead and throw it back to the desk. Right, fantastic stuff coming out from Team Ferox. You can see where we are on the bracket right now. We're in the lower quadrant against Hammers, and they're trying to push forward to get that semi-final placing. And we'll see if they can do it in game number two. But honestly, this was all about Rock Bomber right there. On that Rona, just doing so much work for his team, distracting. I mean, welcome back to the desk, uh, Tasty <laughs> Baker. Welcome back, welcome back. How, how is casting jumping on saving Ooh. us in the last second there? Oh, it's an exciting adventure when you are told last second. Yeah. Hey, I mean, we need to fill in, obviously. It was a lot of fun. Great to be back uh, communicating with Flash X once again. Yeah, absolutely. But, I mean, nothing feels much better then saying something on the analyst desk and then getting the call exactly <laughs> yeah. what you were saying with Ferox falling behind early, mm -hmm. but then coming back and storming on late with those team fights. Like, and Rock Bomber, you mentioned it, absolute star of the late game. I mean, they literally, uh, they personify the, sta the status of late game team. They, don't, they just can't control the game in the early game, but they hold on by the skin of their teeth. <laughs> And then later on, I mean, it's the classic Rona conundrum, right? Where you can't afford to focus Rona because she's tanky. You have to focus her mm -hmm. for too long and you lose the team fight. But if you don't focus her, she is going to tear you apart later on in the game. We saw that right in front of our eyes there. People weren't sure if Rona would be as good in 5v5 because there's more players to focus her. Clearly, she's still a dominant player. <laughs> as long as you get to the late game with her, absolutely. But, you know, I want to also talk about Hammers and the fact that they... Like, it felt like they had this game in the bag. Like, yeah. You know, they get the Black Claw, they find two kills. They very intelligently go for that split push move with it, but then they stay just a little bit too long in that top lane and all, out, and all of a sudden Pico's damage comes out of nowhere. Like, they had been controlling him all game long, and then all of a sudden he jumps in and just bursts down a target. They get that first kill and it just spirals out of control. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we have to talk about Hammer's early game as well. We did see some great stuff coming out from them. Archaic, especially on the Fortress, did a great job trying to control the map, trying to make sure that things are happening. But unfortunately, they couldn't keep things together for long enough. I feel like they needed to, even though they were being proactive, I feel like they needed to put the accelerator down even more. They needed to finish the game faster if they were going to survive mm -hmm. against the light. I mean, I think Moji actually probably did the most damage in that game on the Samuel, just from how long he was in the fights, <laughs> just cleaving away with his... Uh, I mean, Samuel frequently has the highest damage in games just by default because of all that AOE damage he dishes out. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was but it was a full team effort. And that's one of the things I love about watching Team Ferox play is that there isn't... You can't look at it and say like, mm -hmm. oh, it was purely because of Rock Bomber. It was only because of Pico that they won. It was only Moji. Like, it's the entire team coming together when they need to the most. I would, I really want to see them show up this early game if they're going to stand a chance against some of the top teams. But their late game team fighting prowess is excellent. It certainly is. They've just got to get there. That's the biggest task for them right now. So far in the VPL, though, when we talk about the draft, we have only seen our brand new hero once. Silvernail is still pretty much yet to be seen. We saw him once in Europe, but it was in a game two of a series that was pretty much already set. So we didn't really <laughs> get to see it showcased properly. Now, when I've been talking to players, there is even a CP version of this that's viable. But the issue with Silvernail, the reason that a lot of pros haven't been willing to pick him up is he is such a late game hyper carry that you really struggle in the earlier stages of the game to be able to make it effective. But it is about time that we jump on into game number two of the series. Hopefully, we'll see something like a Silver Nail. We have Ferox here, a late game team. I'd love to see them lock in the Silver Nail. <laughs> it would definitely be a lot of, fun. very interesting to see them go for it. But again, have to keep our eyes on the Kensei, the Rona, Rock Bomber again, late game. This is where this guy shines and he makes plays happen. I actually did look at the damage done in that last game, and it was Rock Bomber at the top of the charts, yeah. even above Pico on the Anka or Mosji on the Samuel. So for a Rona to do more damage yeah. than either of those two mages is actually very impressive. Yeah, it was the fight over at top lane mm -hmm. when, when it really turned around for Ferox. We got to see Rock Bomber just jump in, had I think it was three targets that he could just spin around on, grab himself a triple kill, 
And importantly, the reason that, obviously for you guys that haven't seen Rona competitively in the past, the reason that that spinning around is so important, the ability itself doesn't necessarily do that much damage, but you build breaking points that so quickly yeah. that by the time you're done, you're definitely doing the damage. When you've got 20 stacks on a breaking point, you're gonna absolutely murk people. And so that's gonna be Turnwalker coming through as the first pick, immediately gonna get answered with the Grump Jaw. So a lot of early game power, power for both of these sides now to start things off. We'll see how they're gonna try and round out these compositions as they move through this draft. Tony gonna be joining this Grump Jaw, so that's a lot of pressure that they can now apply. Yeah, it certainly will be. We'll see how that Grump Jaw is gonna do up in this matchup. Obviously, Churnwalker is the first pick for the side of Ferox. Churnwalker, incredibly strong, especially in the early game. Maybe that's the kind of pick that they need to tide them over. I'd love to see maybe an early an early game mid laner, like we saw in game number one, we saw them pick the Malin to help Anka. tide them through. Well, they, they worked well for them last game. Pico with this Anka, very likely gonna be in his hands know. once again. I don't know why I said they had Malin in game one. They definitely didn't have yeah. Malin in game one. I mean, Malin was in game one, but it was on the side of hammers. not on their side. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but with, again, getting this Lance as well, and they already had so much burst damage on their side last time that grabbing you know, a similar composition, but throwing in a Churnwalker as well can just spread that damage so effectively. Uh, I, I really like what they're starting to do with this draft. Obviously, a lot of it's going to depend on now what gets picked up here by Hammers. They do go for the Celeste. That's yeah. one of the heroes that we a lot of times see paired with Churnwalker uh, to be able to combo and work together to spread that damage, get those stuns. It can work really well, but it's gonna, they're going to be making sure that it doesn't go that combo over to the side of Ferox. Yeah, they're going to leave the weapon power carry wide open is the final pick there on the side of Hammers. I'm curious which one they go for. Gwen definitely feels like one of the strongest okay. right now. But there's definitely options, you know. I mean, Kensei is obviously banned in this game, as he is in basically every game, but he's kind of the strongest. Idris gonna be locked in. We've seen this like twice, I think, so far in the VPL. There was one week where we saw Idris like in it was half in the Weapon games Power that ended up getting yeah. played, but we haven't really seen it aside from that. Now, hovering over that Rona as well, this would be a very, mm. very you know, powerful team when it comes to dishing out damage. Again, this, very little early game. Though. Very little early game, but I mean, they just showed that that's not their style. They yeah. don't play for this early game. They are all about just surviving until the late game, until those power I spikes mean, come through. When you look at Hammer's squad, it's not exactly an early game powerhouse squad either. They do have the Grump Jaw, obviously. Celeste will get real strong at level eight, but generally speaking, when you think of Celeste, when you think of Sky as carries, you don't think of the They're more very mid -game. early dominant. Mid game yeah. is where their power really comes through, but. I think just having a Grump Jaw almost makes a team an early game composition sure. almost by default. So it'll be interesting to see how they play around those power spikes. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, Hammers, once they do hit that mid game, they're really going to want to apply the pressure heavy and try and close this game out before Ferox can get the ball rolling. Yeah, I mean, but if Ferox gets to the late game again, oh, they've yeah. got Rona again. For any of you who haven't seen Idris competitively, later on in the game, he destroys health bars. He will be rampaging through those team fights. I'm curious whether they get weapon power or a CP, because they have a Rona and they have an anchor. So either way, you're doubling up yep. on one of the paths. It's kind of two different styles of play from interest. Maybe the hybrid. Maybe I the highly hybrid. doubt it, but it is a possibility. All right, well, it's about time that we jump on into the second game here and find out which of these two teams will be jumping into our semifinals. It's going to be uh, Hammers versus Farrakhs, but I had a mind blank there. It's time to pass it over to Flash X and Humanist for game number two. Welcome to game two between Team Ferox and Hammers Esports. My name's Tasty Bake, and I'm joined by Humanist. I mean, my name's Flash X. I'm joined. By... No, I'm Humanist. I'm joined by Flash X. We got it. I'll, I'll be joined by Flash very shortly. We're into the game. I'm back. Sorry about game one, guys. Had some issues on my side, but we're doing good here. Team Ferox taking that impressive victory in game one. We'll see if they can do it back here into game two. I'm sure it's going to be a very exciting matchup. I'm personally uh, favoring a lot of the picks on the board here. I mean, just uh, very fun heroes to, to play some of my favorites as well. Excited to see Mixi getting back in the mix. Archaic as well. We'll move down, take out their Crystal Trant, drop to the double camps while Allie Peterson and Level look to dissuade Ferox off the pressure of their own jungle. 
As far as the early game pressure, I'd expect not to see too much unless someone actually gets caught. We'll have to see, uh, maybe this Lance can land some nice impales as time goes on, set something up, but Moji, he's just gonna need to farm this out. And Flash, are you back? Humanist, I'm here, my friend. I guess it's pretty important when the game starts that you turn your mute button off. We're good to go, though. <laughs> Jumping into game number two. Glad to have you back, my friend. Well, yeah, things are looking very similar to game number one, in all honesty. I am very surprised that Hammers gave Pico his Anka back yet again. That is going to be a pick that they're going to watch out for. Mixi on this Celeste now. He had the lean last game Malene having a lot more in her kit to try and deal with something like that if i were mixy if i were playing celeste i would be very very concerned about this anka it does feel like they have some tools though you know like if anka jumps in there they have ways to disrupt and or peel uh, it's something they'll have to keep their eyes on though absolutely you, you do have the taunt coming out of tony you got a small little heel coming out of the adagio Grumchaw, obviously that thick front line, but Anka with this Shimmer Blade is just so mobile. One second you think she's out of the fight, she blinks straight back on top of you. Definitely very, very efficient at taking down a lot of these squishy backline carries. Rock Bummer on this Rona put it so well in game one. He's looking to get involved. Make sure just defensive core collapse, gonna make sure nobody jumps on in. You can see that from a mile away. Team Ferox with four hammers have five here in the mid lane. Both teams kind of grouping up, waiting for these crystal treant spawns. Of course, they're going to be there right as it does spawn. Looks like hammers secure their own, while Team Ferox drop three down over onto their side. I'm not sure if uh, Archaic wants to move over for that. It should probably be taken up before by the time he gets over there, and indeed it will be. Another slow start out of North America. Hammers having the vision down in this jungle. Feroxo doing a great job at securing their camps. Illist trying to pressure Pico. Pico does manage to secure the healing trance. So it's not going to make any bit of a difference. Moshi, CP Idris, not a hero that we have seen in a long time in this meta. I mean, Ferox today just completely changing the game with a lot of their picks. Uh, you, I mean, you got to love the staple Lance Turnwalker combination. Chan Mu played the Lance so well in game one, had a lot of very, very clutch Githian walls. He's going to be doing, looking to do a lot of the same here in game number two. I think it's going to be really interesting with uh, you have the, the Anka that you have to really worry about. You're going to have Papa John up front on this turn. And that kind of leaves like this opening in the mentality of the game for like interest to kind of get a lot done. And I feel like if you, if you start to focus on shutting that Idris down, a lot of things are going to open up. That's a big first blood for Hammers up in the top lane. Illus taking down the Anka. Pico forgot to press that flash button. Hammers going to take the first turret of the game. So they do have the momentum swung a little bit in their favor. About 90 seconds away from that Ghost Wing coming online. Now's the time that they want to be using their early game strengths of this Grumchaw, of this Tony to extend their lead just a little bit so that they can continue to capitalize on these objectives. Moshi on this Idris in mid lane, not making it easy for them. Not making it easy indeed. And talking about not easy level, not having the easiest time down at bottom. It's not uh, like uh, they're not finding kills on it, but he's consistently just shoved in down there. It's 2v1. He's just holding his own though. So you'd expect the Tony not to get picked off. He's pretty tanky. He's got very durable items not going to go down here in the early game but definitely pinned on the back foot uh crystal trant team ferrix will take it away from hammers esports hammers uh doing the same to uh their opponents here and one zero five minutes in as both teams look to try and get a little control on this map look to get a little bit of control ferrox definitely have the advantage as far as vision goes gold though still very even actually slightly in favor of ferrox so ferrox having a little bit more efficient of these rotations finding the last hits that they need to be able to find so despite giving over that first blood bounty i don't think they're too concerned about it idris five four crystal bits in a heavy prism that is a lot of crystal power he has that cp buff i, I think ferox is in the better position here to look to take that ghost wing if they want to try and melt it i think they're just going to look for this kill on the level instead 
Yeah, uh, they make the, the move onto level. You see that turret's also incredibly low, so they'll take this next. Then this is like prime position, just absolutely perfect position to be taking the ghost swing. It's also a fountain was picked up for Chamu on, on that lance. These guys are ready to fight. Turrets dropped, rock bombers feeling good. Nah, that, that's a nice solar storm to come down the river from Mixi. That definitely sets a couple of their heroes behind. Mixi definitely very competent on this Celeste. That solar storm was a lot of damage. I, I think that if it didn't connect, Ferox might even potentially look for a ghost wing capture right there. But it's going to be Hammers, the one starting it up, actually. And I don't even know if Ferox realizes that this is happening. And if they don't respond very, very quickly, that's going to be uh, an objective that they might want to have back. Oh, man. If we rewind 45 seconds, the, it looked completely the opposite. Like, Hammers were out of position. Team Ferox had everything to make that happen. But Hammers is the quick call to move down, take that objective, and that was clean. They do have this Ghost Wing buff to use to their advantage. As he's here, Gala makes sure he has the spell fire on Celeste online now. Going to be looking to drop those mortal wounds on Rona. But if once Rock Bomber picks up his block and he's just able to jump onto Celeste and spin, spin Red Mist away, yeah, he might be in a little bit of trouble. Spin to win. Rock Bomber is going to have to make sure he stays on target, but simultaneously doesn't get disabled up. It's, it's an interesting uh, style to play, but obviously was able to make it happen in game one. He was able to happen. Rock Bomber, one of these newer faces that I... He's definitely proving himself here. Hammer is definitely one of the most OG organizations in Vainglory. Papa John on this Churnwalker bottom lane, looking to get Hammers chained up. He's jabated in. He got rooted up by the trance, and he'll go ahead and trust pass back. Rock Bomber pulls up to spin, trying to spin to win. It's not going to be enough as Hammers collapse down. They have plenty of damage now. Moji will be forced to use boots to get out of a sticky situation. That'll be 90 second cooldown or so. Mixi doesn't really have a nice lane back uh, or path back into lane. You can see that's where he wants to go. Uh, I guess the, the move from level down the river on the top side will give Mixi a moment where he can get back. And Team Ferox looking to apply a little bit of pressure there in mid. Down in bottom, Hammer's able to take the bottom T1. They've got to be happy about doing at least something off the back of that Ghost Wing buff. They didn't get too much done. The gold, though, still in favor of Team Ferox. I, I find this very, very interesting. This CP Idris, these Chakrams dealing a, a massive amounts of damage. Pico on this Anka, though, finding a turret in the top lane. Churnwalker getting things chained up in the jungle. Ali Peterson dropping the Versa Judgment. Idris taking down the sky. Hammers. Falling apart at the seams is Ferox. Step it up a notch. Turn it up a notch. And uh, they, Hammer seemed to be in a little bit of trouble. That was a great engage by Ferox. They're now flipping things completely on their head. Taking down another turret in the mid lane. Stealing away this crystal tree now as well. They have got to be feeling good. Feeling good about that. That was a very successful turn of events for them. And... Now, I guess you get a little vision down, try to control uh, the pressure that you've put out onto the map. And as far as big power spikes, are, are you seeing anything that really stands out to you, Flash? It's a lot more very similar. I think Papa John opting for this pulse weave first on Churnwalker is very, very interesting. He, he's going to be hopefully going for a Crucible next. They need something to be able to shut down that Versus Judgment. We do have a Crucible on Shamu. But I, I think kind of stacking them up, finding some more blocks, whether it's for a Death from Above or a Core Collapse, which will be very, very for, very important for Ferox to have in these team fights. Ghost Swing back online now. And with Moshi sitting with these double buffs, I really think Ferox, with the tempo that they're controlling right now, should look to get aggressive. Papa John you know, extending himself a little bit into this bottom side jungle. Is it the right extension, though? Mm, it looks like it's the proper extension. Hook and Chains will be blocked off. Pico, up in the top side of the map, will use Boots to get himself out of that taunt. That was a dangerous situation. Most likely would have gone down if caught there. Pico actually finding Mixi on his way to... He's like, you know, I'm a, it's, that's the rhythm of the game. When you escape a gank and you walk yourself into almost finding one of your own. But Pico mirages through this. This guy is like untouchable right now. Pico definitely understands how to position, how to impact 
the map in ways that are very much against the meta. A lot of times you see people sticking with their teams. Ali Peterson in a little bit of trouble. Ali Peterson will let the verse loose in the spirit world because that was just too much to handle. Team Verox in full control, 4K net worth advantage as they mount the pressure onto Hammers Esports at this point. Nice vision down from Hammers, so they see that coming, but Pico still almost finding the kill there. That was pretty insane, and Archaic actually baited out that, or had his uh, stuff baited out, so that's going to be another 60 second cooldown for him. Anka is just so mobile, and it's so hard to play against. Pico wants more. He finds one, but I think he's going to lose his life on the back of it. Dude, that was nuts. Pico's going ham. This is the best Anka that I've seen competitively. 100%. He plays this pick regularly in rank two. If I'm against Pico, I'm definitely banning that out. That's not something I would want him to have. If I were the one competing, but I'm not, Hammers felt like they could deal with it. But Pico making it happen here for the second time in a row now. Do you feel like maybe that was a mistake in the draft, or do you think something that Hammers did consciously to just let it go through and be like, hey, we can beat this? Maybe they don't know Ferox that well. Maybe they haven't had that much experience playing against Pico's Anka. Maybe they felt like they had the answer, but if they did, this is certainly not it. Archaic starting to ramp up a little bit on this Grump shot. He's got the Tension Bow. It looks like he might be going the proc build to the Tension Bow Aftershock. A lot of burst damage. I don't know if necessarily that's what his team needed, though. I, I feel like a lot of the carries, or really all of them, except for Idris, are very, very tanky or mobile enough, like the Anka, where they don't even have to worry about it. Ferox, though, looking for the first Black Claw capture of the game. Hammer's rotating to get in position to contest. They found Pico. Pico Zen. He splits with the Mirage. Hard to lock this guy down. Well, Solar Storm will connect. Pico's got to get back. That's the fountain coming out of Chamu. We'll keep him alive. Black Claw was unleashed. And Rock Bombers in deep. Mix she's down. Suri Strike from the sky to try and reposition. Impale lands onto the Adagio as Grumchaw falls. A clean take by Moji. Now Ali Peterson left for dead as hammers are falling apart at the seams. Pico. He's found level isolated over here. You know Pico wants to go for this, but level, you gotta be careful. He could turn this around and pump out a fair bit of damage. He'll go ahead and proc off that pulse wave, then probably jump back in as a black clock continues to march down the lane. And it's just a little ring around the roads with Pico and level. Armory goes down in that hammer's base here. And Team Ferox, see how they're gonna play this out. Mm, they're just gonna go ahead and safely back on out. And these guys playing clean, patient, and simultaneously aggressive. Very well calculated hats off the Ferox. They are showing that despite going up against the veteran Hammers team, they themselves are the veteran players keeping their composure very, very well. Very happy to take down that one armory, reset, go back, take the ghost wing. I absolutely love this shot call. I'd be really interested to know who Ooh. the shot caller is for this team. Solar Storm coming in hot. Just a little bit too late, not able to find the steal. Ferox continuing their momentum. That was a nice attempt out of Mixi. I don't think he even had vision on that, but a nice attempt. Not going to happen, though. Team Ferox continue their lead level, hiding in the brush down here. <laughs> I'm out of here. Surprise. Hi, guys. They'll go ahead and clean out this wave that was crashing down onto his T2 in the bottom lane while Pico continues to move forward. How's that Gosoing buff looking for a target? He's found Mixi. Mixi, this could be bad for you. He's in. He's got the blades damage coming out. I don't put Mixi down at 30% health, but quickly backup arrives. As you see, these hook and chains coming out. Papa John's got the trespass onto Adagio to set up the impale. Mirage comes out. Try to keep track of this Anka through this fight. Pico is in deep. Well, Rock Bomber just spins all over him, baby. Archaic is stuffed up, so he's going to pull him back to the healing platform. Is this going to be enough? Slumbering Husk procs off. Rona's able to get out of it. Okay, that's how you know you lost the game. My goodness, Team Ferox. This is a dominating performance right here. Absolutely putting on a show. Hammers Esports, I mean, I thought this is a team to be reckoned with, but Team Ferox, holy wow. Team Ferox stepping it up big time, definitely drafting to their strengths. The question is, how deep do these hero pools go and how will they survive? They are in the semi-finals now. We'll go ahead and throw it back to the desk.